all this time, you have been making choices in your life. You've been choosing light and dark, which essentially is your father's way and the way of the world. The more you choose of the world's way, the more of the world you become. The father's coming back. And he's sending a slew of things prior to his coming that will destroy darkness, that will just utterly beat down darkness. If you have that darkness in you, you're going to partake of those plagues. You know, there's a warning in the Bible, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you don't partake of her plagues. That's one of those standout scriptures right now. If you are a partaker of the sins of any place you're in, you're going to be a partaker of the wrath that comes to that sin, because you will have been a vessel of the sins of of that place. The Lord told us to come out of the world. Now, come out of the world, that doesn't mean to move from one place to another. It's not what it means. But that the world should have nothing in you. You remember in John, when Jesus was talking, he said, But the prince of the world cometh, and he hath nothing in me. That means Satan had no power to influence or do anything else to Christ, because after he made it out of the wilderness, having stayed his course in the Father's scriptures, Satan had no investment, no anything in him. There was no darkness in Christ. The Bible teaches us that Jesus was in all points tempted as we are. Can you imagine that? A lot of people think he just wasn't tempted to do anything. That's wrong. He overcame the temptation. He was in flesh just like you and I. His soul was divine, yes, but he was in flesh just like you and I. And he chose not to give in to the flesh. And so he did not give in to Satan. If you look carefully back in your life, you could have abstained from anything, but we made a choice not to. So this time around, the devil, darkness, no dark forces are supposed to have anything in you. And what that means is this. You're drawn to whatever has an investment in you. You have to look at it this way. If there was a big black ball in the world, it came to earth, what it would do was draw all darkness to it. So all darkness would gravitate towards it. Why? Because there's a piece of that darkness in each person that is drawn to it. But if you're one of those people that you don't have that darkness in you, you'll not be drawn to it. Right now, there are situations in the world, and you've got to understand the spiritual nature of it. The entirety of the purpose of the beast system is to draw unto itself all the tears. If you go walking with the tears to the heart of darkness, which are the ways of men in this earth that are against the principles and ways of our Father, if you go walking towards it, walk hand in hand with it, you will have the same punishment they will have. You will endure of the same plagues they will endure. Do you all see how that works? They're about to have plague after plague after plague. But the Lord already promised to those who remain under the shadow of the Almighty that it will not come near them. And we're not talking about just war. War is something of man that's just like a backyard fight. No, we're talking about real plagues, like a plague of demons, a plague of a sickness that you're trying to kill yourself every day, but you won't be able to. A plague where you will want to die, but you'll have no power to die. A plague of being dead through and through, yet you still experience the hunger and thirst of the living. I want you guys to reflect in your life at the worst moment you ever had in your life. Now, I want you to imagine you never being able to escape that. That means for the nightmare, no waking up. For the physical condition, no relief. Those who have been in car accidents where they were crunched and they felt that crunch and they were going crazy because of the cramped spaces. Imagine no release from that. That's what the world is about to endure. God has been merciful, merciful, merciful to all of us. But all those who choose the world will endure every plague of the world. The Lord called us out of the world. And he's been teaching us how to stay separate from the world. Yet we live in it, yes. But we are not to have the world within us. Those who came out of the wilderness from Egypt, they had to die in the desert because Egypt was still in there. And if the world still be found within you, you will endure what the world endures. You're about to see what the world endures. Nothing is going to go according to plan. That means nobody's plan is going to work out. The Lord is going to quickly demonstrate that he is holy. Man is not holy. And what man built is not holy. He is holy. But there are some people who are now surfacing. And they're going to try and teach you that somehow man's kingdoms are holy. No, they're not. If man's systems or kingdoms were holy any place on this earth, there would be no need for the Lord to decimate every single country that exists. And if Israel is going to be purged and trampled underfoot for 42 months, you know that no Nobody else has a chance. Think about it. I'm telling you, the Lord is calling his people out from among the other folks. As the tares gather together, as they now surface and become true radicals, becoming what they really are, you might want to step away from that 
upon identification. But let me warn you, there are going to be some among you who are not like you. They will finally rise up and join the tares in full. They will prosecute you all the way out. But they're going to become part of the tares. You're going to see them choose the world over anything of Christ because they are full of the world. Those of you who have been purged from the world, you won't be moved, but you will be saddened by how you see other people stand up and walk directly to the world believing everything the world says. Those of you who are full of Christ, he is your redeemer and your salvation. You have that security and that security will then operate within you. Can't you tell that supernaturally some of the statements in the earth are appealing to your flesh? They make you want to rise up and join the fight, don't they? That's a supernatural lure. That's just like Satan. When Jesus went into the wilderness, when he was drawn away into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost to be tempted of the devil, the devil came to him and tried to appeal to Jesus in things that were so commonplace. He was was appealing to the flesh. For example, he said, see all these kingdoms? I'll give all of them to you if you bow down and worship me. Now, why would that be tempting unto Christ? Because in your flesh, you do want recognition. You want someone to say, ah, there's so-and-so. You want someone to look at you and to finally say that you're important, that we can't do without you. You want that. When you're hungry and starving, you want to feed your body. I've been so hungry one time, I'm telling you the truth, everything looks good. And your taste buds change. The things that makes you sick right now, they make you sick. If you were to start starving, you'd be shocked at what your body would do. Something sour could taste very sweet in your mouth. But then again, Jesus didn't eat the entire time. Then Satan comes up. Well, if you're the son of God, just turn this rock right there into bread. He was trying to appeal to what? The flesh of Christ. And everything Satan presented, he was appealing to the flesh of Christ. Not to the spirit of Christ, but Christ remained in the spirit, not giving in to his flesh. His flesh was hungry and thirsty. He was rejected. Satan appealed to every faculty of your flesh. He cannot appeal to anything else. The bread, the kingdoms for power, that he be recognized and not shunned and rejected. Are you kidding me? Satan, Satan was tempting him with things of flesh. Look at what's in the world. Right now, the greatest temptation, the greatest lure to people is this. Prove yourself right and prove them wrong. That's what he's doing. What do you hear the average person saying? Oh, we're going to lose our country. I'm sorry, that's not up to mankind. Time for us to trust in the word of God. But we're going to lose everything we have. So it's only materialistic things. What's truly yours, they can never take away. No one can ever take away what's truly yours. It is God who establishes kings. And if he establishes kings, if he seats them and unseats them, nobody has anything to worry about. But they are. I'll tell you why. People love to trust the Lord when everything is okay. But when everything goes south, they start believing flesh almost instantly, which brings rage. They're becoming violent. People are going to the extreme. They're not backing down. They're not satisfied. They're angry. And Satan is starting to rise and flourish. The draconian system in spirit can hardly do anything but influence mankind. Now that the infrastructure and the structure has been laid in the earth, spiritually, things are taking over. Finding placement within everybody who agrees with it. And right now they found a reason. See, Satan will devise many different scenarios and then utilize what he built to lure mankind inside and cause man to fall. That's all he wants. The Bible says when Satan speaks a lie, he speaks of his own. What is that supposed to mean? When he speaks a lie, which is Satan to speak anyway, he's speaking of something he did long ago. Satan is an architect. He builds things. You think God built Babylon? You think God devised the rule of law? No, he didn't. All those came from ancient kingdoms. Those are ways of men. Is there anything wrong with that? No, it isn't. But it is if you're not moral. It is if evil takes over. If darkness steps in, why do you think the founding fathers found prayer so important? In fact, didn't they say if people stopped praying, the Constitution, the rule of law, would be abandoned? It would be perverted. Then it will become a nightmare, an oppressive tool. Do you know they said that about the Constitution and the rule of law? It can become an oppressive tool in the hands of those who reject their creator. I wonder who read that one. You don't hear that read, do you? In fact, you hear complete separation of what they wrote and what's in play right now. You've seen the integrity of folks. Don't be blinded by loyalty to flesh. Make sure that your loyalty is with Christ, that your eyes be open and you will never be blinded. Satan will appeal to your flesh. If you are moved in the flesh by what is happening, then you're moved by Satan's appeal. You're moved by one of his tactics. He knows everything about your flesh. He knows how it works. He knows it much better than you do. But guess what? I know Christ better than he does. And by the power of Christ and by his blood that can never be unspilt, 
I'm kept. Why do you think we die to our flesh daily? If we listen to the word of God, we're not prone to the devices of Satan. But the days have arrived. The instruction has been given. All of us know this. All of us know that in many people who spoke in their hearts were massive amounts of instruction saying the same thing over and over again a million different ways. It's instruction of how to follow Christ, how to continue to follow Christ. Certain things you'll face, what the world's going to do, but to continue to follow Christ over and over again. Now we come to those days where we put what we have learned, utilizing the wisdom we have had in a practice to follow Christ in all given circumstances and situations to be those who have developed a trust with the Lord because you're finding out you can't trust the world nor can you trust mankind you can love your fellow man but put all your faith and trust in the living God those who are steeped in flesh have to vent nobody who is up the spirit ever has to vent because venting is up the flesh the spirit is not deaf and dumb or blind it need not vent it is very thing. And by the way, it's born again spirit, so it's not of this earth, and it carries no traits of flesh. What's missing in people's lives is they will see a physical situation, a real situation before them. All of a sudden, all they can see are physical solutions. Wrong! You are spirit! You know, the Bible says you are no longer flesh, but you are spirit. And if you are spirit, you're walking around with spiritual authority you don't know how to use. When you see two people, you're caught in the middle of something that's awful and terrible. Who is the one telling everybody you have to physically fight your way out of it? Wrong! He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. You are occupying a place nobody else can get to. That's what happens. That's the supernatural place. If you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, then the Bible says you shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Why the shadow of the Almighty? That means His presence is with you. Did you ever read it that way? It says, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall. You know, that's a decree. You will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's a guarantee is what that is. You know, the Lord said, let there be light, didn't he? He said, let there be light, there was light. God saw that the light was good. Every time he said, let there be something, or uses that word shall, that doesn't mean maybe. No, that word shall is a decree. It's a decree. When you find yourself in the middle of a situation, and if you dwell in the secret place of the Most High, I'm telling you right now, God will give you instant instruction. Instruction that supersedes anything you ever thought of, any concept you ever thought of in your own mind. Because you're in the flesh, you have a reason not to love. So then your reason for loving should be higher than your reason for not loving. In fact, you have a reason for being bitter. You have a reason for just about everything. But I'm telling you now, if you accept your Lord and Savior, He has already given you reasons higher than any reason that could ever exist for you hating someone. He's given you a reason to love all. You need to investigate those reasons. How many times have you tried to do something to better yourself and you failed? That happens to people a lot. They try to better themselves in some sort of way, but just doesn't fall through. Do you know why, though? There's an answer. There's a reason why. And the question was, again, if you try to better yourself and it doesn't work, don't you know why? When we try to better ourselves, we're trying to do it because we recognize a change is needed within us. But the problem is to better yourself for yourself is not a very good reason. I'm not going to get healthy just so for what? So I can continue to live and do what? The reason is not strong enough. I'm telling you right now, because some people are truly humble and truly meek, because their life does not mean that much to them in the first place, and these would be the ones who are not concerned about being right. See, if your life does not matter to you a whole lot, if your own personal life does not matter to you a whole lot, you're not concerned about being right. You're not concerned about people rejecting you or anything else, because you automatically live that way in the first place. You have a different set of concerns. You're normally concerned about other folks. But we fail in trying to do something for ourselves, trying to better ourselves, because we are not a good enough reason. But guess what? If I knew I had someone that would copy everything I did, or that I had massive influence over someone, it would become so easy to change everything I'm doing for their sakes. So you have to have a reason that's larger than you are. And the Lord gave you a reason much larger than you are. But the question is, what are you going to see it that way? I found one thing to be true, one thing to be true. The most troubled person I know is a much bigger reason for me to change certain things. I have enemies. I don't name people enemies. They name me an enemy. But I have changed things I have done 
for their sakes because they couldn't understand, they couldn't comprehend. It will cause them to respond as a way. I have changed things for them. I have laid down things because of my love for them. I'm talking about my enemies. They are a worthy reason to reach them. There are certain things I will never do again because it prohibits me from reaching a certain group of people. I do it every single time. Then when you read in the Bible and you see where the Lord sent the apostles out two by two and how they went to certain houses and how Paul gave instruction, he said, listen, if you go into a household and they don't eat a certain thing, then don't you eat it either. So you don't offend them so you can continue to speak to them. And if they do eat something, that possibly maybe you have deemed as unclean or something like that. He said, go ahead and eat it so you don't offend them. That's what he said. Because your purpose for being there is not to get caught up on traditional rudiments, but for the sake of the gospel. It's as simple as this. I can lay myself aside for the sake of the gospel, but I cannot lay myself aside for my own sake. I just can't do it for my own sake. I'm no good at saving myself. But I can get rid of everything for the gospel because it's a big enough cause, it's a big enough reason. I can never find a reason large enough for me to do something for me. It's just not there. But I can look at you and you are my motivator. We need our Lord more and more. We need our foundations fortified our foundations of faith. We need that foundation fortified. And because the world is using tactics that are quite strong, so will the Holy Spirit build up in each of you who is obedient to the Lord. Remember something the Holy Spirit has promised to those who obey the Lord. It will not be given to those in power by way of power who don't obey the Lord. Every single person alive has been instructed, convicted, or something by the Spirit. A spirit needs one point of entry, not 50. And it can come through anybody. It doesn't necessarily have to come through the individual. That will be named, you know, the big wig of darkness either. It doesn't work that way. It can come through very innocent places, through vulnerabilities, through wounds, through, you know, several different places, through various people. But once it enters, what it does is it immediately attempts to work and it draws any other spirit that's in the earth at the time of the entry of that type of spirit. It will begin to draw other spirits to it. And through communication, slowly changing the mindset of the person, how they communicate, and how they see it, begins to draw other spirits unto itself. Because what it essentially wants to do is enter into this world and then it begins to feed, it feeds other spirits. It begins to build almost like a coalition against righteousness. Don't ever forget, everything you see in the world ultimately boils down to a weapon against you. You got to understand that. Right now we have people in the world, and I'm, I'm telling you that some of these people are still in their sinful nature. It does not mean they're condemned. It means while a person is an operator of sin, they can be used as a weapon against you until they submit to the call. Do you guys understand that? That's just like when we were in sin, no doubt we were used against other righteous folks, and we didn't even know it. A child with a Bible-believing mother and dad can often be used to test the limits of their mother and father. They don't know that. But they can sometimes drive their parents to anger, cause their parents to say things they wouldn't ordinarily say. All of us have seen this. So what I'm telling you is that through almost a type of innocence or unknowing, sin can work in places that we're not paying attention to. And when it does, it immediately begins to target those who try to maintain righteousness. Your light draws these spirits straight onto you. Now, put this on a bigger scale. The same way the child does not know it is driving its mother and its dad to points of sin, to say sinful things, to think sinful thoughts, to have thoughts of anger and vengefulness and blame and all these other, to stir fights against the man and the woman in a family. The same way a child can do this unknowingly, so do people in the world try to draw you in. This Republican and Democratic fight that you see is doing nothing more than drawing Christians into it. It will continue to go this way like a vacuum to attempt to get to you. In fact, that's why things repeat themselves. They simply repeat. It's not that they get worse. It's not that they get better. They just simply exist. They keep doing the same thing every time Christians are drawn in. And then Christians are compromised by the arguments they hear. Because knowing that you may join one side or the other, they want you to play the game they're playing. Now, because I see this, I never do it. I'm never drawn into arguments in politics. I don't fall for the stuff. It doesn't mean you turn your back on politics. It doesn't mean you turn your back on your government. That's not what it means. It just simply means you're not going to develop an attitude against 
against a whole people because of a man-made ideology. Because essentially, that's what's happening. They're both ideologies, and they've actually caused men to hate men over an ideology. You think the father's going to say, well, I totally understand that you were an independent and you didn't. No, that's not what he's going to say. No, if we are gullible to such things, and we, for the most part, if you're blind, you're gullible, you're going to be drawn into these fights. You're going to pick one side or the other. That's a tactic of the enemy. They will appeal to your sense of everything, your sense of country, your sense of duty, your sense of humanity. They will appeal to anything to get you to join a side. Once you join a side, there are others there that will reinforce the importance of you staying with that side. And if you stay there long enough, you're stuck. The Lord called us out of all of that stuff. That's what he considers the world are these ideologies of men. As a Christian, I can stand away from both Democrats and Republicans and see the good portions or the good intention portions of government. And I can actually fight for some of those causes without being compromised by being a Democrat or Republican. Do you see how that works? Because I'm not going to fight another person over someone else's ideology. I will never take up the weapons of men to slay a brother or sister. And both are, in fact, brothers and sisters. When you're speaking about ideologies, because we operate by spiritual things, things that Christ gives us. We could say that the gospel is a doctrine that we do follow. Well, the world has another doctrine. I'm not going to take up a, a worldly doctrine and then adopt that to kill my brother and my sister. I'm not doing that. So, see, I, I, I have a different approach because I am not drawn into one side or the other. I'm standing in the kingdom. I can see men fight each other over these things, but I'm standing with Christ. Christ did not take up the banner of some independents, some Pharisees, or anybody else. He didn't do that. He established something different. When the Lord comes, there will be no Democrats or Republicans or independents or anybody else. There will be those who are the redeemed and those who are not. These kingdoms of this world and every idol in the earth will be torn down. It will be taken down. Everything will fall. Everything. Now, if something was so good, why would it fall? Why, when the Lord comes back, is all this stuff destroyed? If it's so good. See, I tend to go through the Bible backwards and say, well, what's going to last? What did God call holy? He called people holy. He never called a place except for one place, which they defiled. He called that holy. Everything else is in opposition to his standards. And most things that look like they operate within the gospel are in fact ploys to get you involved. Even in history, did the folks who founded the Constitution, did they have a did they have a godly mindset? We don't know that. But we can read the Constitution and we can see parts of the Constitution where they honored the Ten Commandments, where they honored God's word. We can see that. But what they have done today was make amendments to the same thing where they can circumvent it. If if you set out a policy like everybody should have the freedom to say what they want, well if you do that in an ungodly place, you have just released hell on earth. And that's what happens. Even the founding fathers said the Constitution will not work with immoral people. Why do you think one of the first uh, schools they set up, it was mandatory. You had to learn the Bible. Why? To keep man moral. Why do you think they were so strict about moral practices? They were strict about indecency. Yes, you had people at the time that were indecent and were immoral, but I'm talking about those who founded, those who wrote the Constitution. They thought about the children. They took great pains to write that document. And they always thought about the living God. In fact, all of them confessed, despite what they were. They were A lot of them were Masons. But they did confess, only with the blessing of God could this nation be established in the first place. Over the course of time, though, men of iniquity stepped in. And now that freedom of speech grants that Satan may say anything he wants. That's what you hear. That's where it gets a little sticky. Because if you want America to be like it was, you have to get rid of all immoral people. That's an impossible task for man because man is immoral himself. That is a task for the most time. So what we do is we put forth our best effort to establish decency, accountability, things like that. But that's all we can do. It will not, nor will it ever be a perfect system. It will not. It will always give way to darkness, and people have had to live with that for a long time. They're looking for perfection, and the documents were never to make something perfect. It was to govern the people that would live side by side, one with another, that no one would rise with an ideology to usurp the papers and be a dictator. 
but that that spirit of being a dictator always attempts to rise through immorality. Now, Satan works like this, though. He'll take well-intentioned men, and he will pervert them because they have to be covered by the blood of the Lamb, period. You cannot practice iniquity and then claim you're covered by the blood of the Lamb, but your thoughts are iniquitous. You cannot do that. Nor can you pull Christians beside you, still having that heart of iniquity, and expect to be holy. It won't work. It's a choice we all have to make. And I'm going to tell you something. There's no way in the world a person can run the country with the people in it like they are right now and be holy. Listen, there were days when I was in a certain place and I said, oh my Lord, give me strength. I have to go to work today. Now, who would have to say that? As soon as you hit the door, there's a situation. There's cursing here. There's people saying this and that over here. You have to do this. You have to plot this. You have to see who's doing this. What are these folks about? You're spying on people. You're doing all sorts of stuff. And, and when you're doing all that, it takes a lot to keep your spirit intact. I'm just telling you what I know. There's no way you can be of a higher position like the presidency of the United States of America and keep you. If, it's just not going to work. So God calls specific men to power, not that they're holy, but that they have a heart to do a specific thing he desires. For example, the beast. Did the beast just happen to his position? No. God appoints a specific time for the beast to be in power. You know what it means? Our father's in control. He's doing something. But if we don't know what he's doing, we're going to find ourselves fighting against him. We'll complain about what he's doing. We'll become a nation of complainers. Right now, there's so many people complaining. And it's really a trap. It's like a spider's web. What's happening right now? On both sides, it's just like a spider's web. On both sides, you have hatred. But you also have some who weep for the nation, but you have some who are done with the nation. And still you have some that want to reestablish the nation. And they're all mixed in together. And it's a very tricky space, spot for somebody who does not know the interworkings of politics. Politics is brutal. It has never, it has never been kind. You might want to be thankful the Lord didn't pick you to sit in one of their seats. Instead of complaining, you know, I have a habit of saying thank you, Lord, for not utilizing me to be in one of those positions of power. I really do say that because I know that if you are a God-fearing person to sit in one of those seats, you face being compromised every hour of your life. He raises up kings despite who you think they are. He raises them up. He formulates their life in a certain way to produce a person who does exactly what God desires them to do at that time. See, it's not that they sit around and commune with God all the time. No. If he raises them, then their natural behavior is going to be to carry out his will. For the Assyrian, that meant to destroy. For Cyrus, that meant to uproot and to reestablish. But if we were to see these men today, we would say they were disgusting. If you were under the rule of Cyrus right now, you would say Cyrus is disgusting. That's what you would say. Everybody would point to him as the Antichrist. He was not an Antichrist. He performed the will of God. It was in his nature. Did it look like it was holy work he was doing? No, it did not. That's exactly why God picked Cyrus. He picked the Assyrian. The, the Assyrian loved war. Why in the world would God call the Assyrian his act? But that's what he called him, because he was raised to do the will of God according to God's will, not man's will. Not what we think should happen, but what God actually decreed. What we think will happen is not always God's will. Even when we give it our best analysis, it is not always God's will. God knows exactly what he's doing. We would do well to follow what he's doing, because what he has doing is what has been done. If it's been done, God did it. Where are the complaints at then? When prophecy comes to pass, the world is going to blaspheme God for doing it. Do you know why? Because you're going to be looking for something else. Did you notice in Revelation how they blaspheme God for everything that happened just like people are doing now? It is God who seats a king. It is God who unseats a king. So if somebody kicks the king out, God did it. If somebody seats that king, God did it. He has to raise a person up to meet certain qualifications to appeal to the people at the exact time to become that king in the first place, doesn't he? They go through a lot to sit in that chair. So God has to raise a person in a specific way to overcome multiple things to even qualify in the people's minds to sit in that chair. If it were a dictatorship, they still had to rise up through the ranks to admit the qualifications of those so they could sit in that seat or be in that position at the time to sit there by default. Either way, that is the coordination from above. You've got to see that. And if it is, then where are all the saints' complaints now? Saints are in distress as though something has happened that God doesn't want to happen. Let me tell you something. If God didn't want something to 
happen, it's just not going to happen. God is not feeble. He's not old, sitting up in his chair asleep. He just, God fell asleep again. He's not doing that. God is not a person either. God is not made after the nature of man, but we're made in the image and likeness of the Creator. We have so many things backwards till we go into a panic. We do that with our own situations. We act like our situation is out of control. No, it isn't. You just don't like the way your situation is going, but God knows exactly what he's doing in your life. He's raising you too. In fact, he's raising everybody simultaneously. Nothing is out of control. We would do well to remember that so that we don't become hostile, get out of place, and lose our minds. Prophecy is what God is going to do. He's already established it. Nobody can change it. That's just the way it is. So don't panic, but be observant. Don't be discouraged. Be observant. Understand that your father is working and moving. And when you see trouble in the earth, and because he's in charge of all things, he's allowing it to happen. He already told us he would do it. What iniquity, he said, the brutish man doth not know. But when iniquity flourishes as grass, it is because it's going to be destroyed forever. This rising of iniquity, the getting away of things in the world, don't get baited and, 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 and then glued into such situations withdraw from that come out of her now don't join in with him get out of it that's not your place you have a different walk you're held by a different standard and you have a different mandate everybody who tried to step into the situation with presidents and sit there and change the direction have failed and they failed for a reason every single person i heard it with the bushes i heard it with clinton these are i'm talking about the ministers who trying to alter the direction of the presidency they can't do that God controls that rudder, not mankind. And we would do well to remember that. Somebody may ask, well, what do you do? Just sit back and let stuff happen? Are you kidding? You know, that really shows us a level of faith. A lot of people say, well, I'm just supposed to sit and do nothing. What can you do? Go do what you can do. And let's see what it does. Well, they have done that. What it do? Nothing. It yielded no good thing. In fact, it tied their hands up even more. Guess what I'll do? I'll pray. I don't need to force anybody to do anything. I'll go petition the creator, the, the one who created all this stuff. He'll hear. He'll make a adjustments according to his grace and mercy and his heart and his will upon the earth at that time. I trust him. I trust his outcome. I don't trust mine. You know what? I don't even trust the formation of my own prayers because I may not have the right idea for another. So I petition. I put my two cents into the Father. But as far as him doing something specifically, that's up to him. He knows the best thing to do. I petition on behalf of others. Like, Lord, I know they don't understand, but I didn't understand either back in my day. Can you extend them the great mercy as you did me? Because I remember how that felt. So please don't make it as hard on them as you did on me if the outcome is going to be this. That's how I petition. I don't try to forecast what God will do. Well, God, take this person and make this person have this, that, and Because you know what? If God were to answer every prayer that we had in our minds, we're not perfect in that petition. And God granted what we wanted another to have, we could interfere with the raising of just about everybody. How about when somebody gets hurt? We don't want to see somebody get hurt, but getting hurt is necessary to grow us. It is important that a child fall when he's learning to walk because he learns limitations. He learns distance. He learns that, wait a minute, that corner was not my imagination. That was real. It's important for some people to burn themselves. That saves their lives later on. But if it were up to us, nobody would burn themselves. Nobody would hurt themselves nobody would do anything and when they got up in age they would all die why because they did not learn the lessons of hardship in the beginning we would get in the way of god raising his children if he answered all of our prayers of sympathy that we get so i trust him in his way i remember first coming to cot right and people said well we got to protect the little ones i said are you kidding you don't need to protect the little ones god said the little ones are all their angels are always at the throne no, what you need to do is make sure that you're doing right by the little ones. Well, somebody might lead them astray, but well, they have to go out there and get beat up. Because if they don't go out there and get beat up, they'll not learn who the tricksters are. And when they get older, when they get established, their whole life will fall apart. Why? Because they had no experience with the deceiver. That's why some of you don't drive that fast anymore. Because you wrecked your car, and it took that accident to really drill it into you that this car can be dangerous. And now, you don't drive so fast. Because you understand it can kill somebody. You see? If you hadn't had that accident, you would have had no respect for that vehicle. 
There are people that drink and drive all the time. You ask, why do you drink and drive? Oh, well, I'm just, you know, I probably won't do it in the future. That one time, one mistake, one accident, and their whole life is over. The Lord is merciful. He'll have somebody do it early. He'll have somebody do it to a stop sign instead of to a car with five children. You wouldn't want to be responsible for killing five children, would you? So, of course, you ran into the stop sign. Of course, you got caught. You got really embarrassed. Of course, you did. That kept you from killing an entire family. Why? Because you wouldn't stop doing what you were doing. The Lord knows what he's doing. We don't know what he's doing sometimes. That's why we would do well to observe and to pray. He gave us standing instructions, the Great Commission. Isn't that enough to do? While they're fighting over the Democrats and Republicans and trying to make up excuses and accusations, what we need to really do is do just what Jesus said to do. Our activities are important, not to take up for anybody. I don't really take up for folks, but I can understand their position. So I'm compassionate to people, even President Trump. Oh, yes, even to Barack Obama. You see, you didn't hear me talk about either one of them like they were dogs. You didn't hear me say that. I don't care what anybody else says. I go by the conviction the Lord gives me. I can't go by man's sayings and what man knows. I look to the Father for that because he knows each and every one of us. This spirit that operates in the world, you got to be careful with it. This is why the Lord told us to come out of the world. So much liberty in the kingdom. Now, what's in the world? God is clearly giving iniquity its moment. That's why it's rising in the first place. See, you've stepped into a time when we can see what everybody else is doing. This is the exact time when darkness multiplies in everything. And it will draw all darkness unto itself. But the Lord has different plans for you. The work you are to do. Believe me, it's a lot of people waiting on you. They're not waiting on me. They're waiting on you. I'm trying to do what the Lord gave me. The Lord knows I've only done a smidget of it. But I'm trying to do what the Lord gave me to do. But the Lord gave you something to do. And they await you. See, some people were on this earth sent before you. And then you were sent after. Why? Because they're waiting on you to come to your place. Likely so they can be delivered in a few things. Because God put it in you to say things a certain way that only they could hear. They're not waiting on anybody else. You were sent here for them. Why do you think you have the calm, that compassion to follow Christ? But you can't give them what you think. You must give them the truth. And the truth only comes from one place. at your Father in heaven. Remember, the world does not have the spirit of truth because it cannot see it. Your Father is the origin of all truth. That means if you obey the will of God for your life, if you comply with His standards, and indeed if you develop that relationship with Him, you will do what he sent you here to do for the people he sent you here for. See, I know this. Once I have done what I'm sent here to do, I'm going home. I will have finished my race. My true passion is to finish my race. It is not to stay in the earth, become famous, have all this money in the earth, and that's not it. My true passion is to finish my tasks and to go home. The same thing he did to me, he did to you. You are the answer for somebody's life. You're the prayer for somebody. You are that prayer. You're the answer to somebody's prayer. You don't even know it yet. You will not be the answer if you say no to Christ. And believe it or not, the same prayer that you prayed for in your time of desperation, the Lord made you the answer because somebody else was also saying that same prayer. No one came for you, but you are to go to somebody else. And you need to be in your rightful position to do that. Man cannot direct you in that. He can't. Only your father can. Your absolute willing heart to obey the Lord will further that calling line. Everybody says they want to be pleasing unto the Lord. That's what they say. I'm going to be pleasing unto the Lord. You do? Then obey Him. Obey Him that you may participate in His great work of salvation. Because that is His great work in the earth right now. is salvation. And say He is that opposition to salvation. So yes, expect for Him to try and derail you. He'll try to capture all of your attention. Take your focus off of Christ. It's time for everybody to wake up.